On the Jews and Their Lies by Dr. Martin Luther I had made up my mind to write no more either about the Jews or against them, but since I learned that these miserable and accursed people do not cease to lure to themselves even us, that is, the Christians, I have published this little book so that I might be found among those who opposed such poisonous activities of the Jews and who warned the Christians to be on their guard against them. I would not have believed that a Christian could be duped by the Jews into taking their exile and wretchedness upon himself. However, the devil is the god of the world, and wherever God's word is absent, he has an easy task, not only with the weak, but also with the strong. May God help us. Amen. Grace and Peace in the Lord Dear Sir and Good Friend, I have received a treatise in which a Jew engages in dialogue with a Christian. He dares to pervert the scriptural passages which we cite in testimony to our faith concerning our Lord Jesus Christ and Mary his mother, and to interpret them quite differently. With this argument, he thinks he can destroy the basis of our faith. This is my reply to you and to him. It is not my purpose to quarrel with the Jews, nor to learn from them how they interpret or understand Scripture. I know all of that very well already. Much less do I propose to convert the Jews, for that is impossible. Those two excellent men, Lyra and Bergensis, together with others, truthfully described the Jews' vile interpretation for us 200 and 100 years ago, respectively. Indeed, they refuted it thoroughly. However, this was no help at all to the Jews, and they have grown steadily worse. They have failed to learn any lesson from the terrible distress that has been theirs for over 1,400 years in exile, nor can they obtain any end or definite terminus of this, as they suppose, by means of the vehement cries and laments to God. If these blows do not help, it is reasonable to assume that our talking and explaining will help even less. Therefore, a Christian should be content, and not argue with the Jews. But if you have to or want to talk with them, do not say any more than this. Listen, Jew, are you aware that Jerusalem and your sovereignty, together with your temple and priesthood, have been destroyed for over 1,460 years? For this year, which we Christians write, as the year 1542, since the birth of Christ, is exactly 1,468 years, going on 1,500 years, since Vespasian and Titus destroyed Jerusalem and expelled the Jews from the city. Let the Jews bite on this nut and dispute this question as long as they wish. For such ruthless wrath of God is sufficient evidence that they assuredly have erred and gone astray. Even a child can comprehend this, for one dare not regard God as so cruel that he would punish his own people so long, so terribly, so unmercifully, and in addition keep silent, comforting them neither with words nor with deeds, and fixing no time limit and no end to it. Who would have faith, hope, or love toward such a God? Therefore this work of wrath is proof that the Jews surely rejected by God, are no longer his people, and neither is he any longer their God. This is in accord with Hosea chapter 1. Call his name not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yes, unfortunately, this is their lot, truly a terrible one. They may interpret this as they will. We see the facts before our eyes, and these do not deceive us. If there were but a spark of reason or understanding in them, they would surely say to themselves, O Lord God, something has gone wrong with us. Our misery is too great, too long, too severe. God has forgotten us, etc. To be sure, I am not a Jew, but I really do not like to contemplate God's awful wrath toward this people. It sends a shudder of fear through body and soul, for I ask, what Will the eternal wrath of God in hell be like toward false Christians and all unbelievers? Well, let the Jews regard our Lord Jesus as they will. We behold the fulfillment of the words spoken by him in Luke 21. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. For these are days of vengeance, 
for great distress shall be upon the earth and wrath upon this people. In short, as has already been said, do not engage much in debate with Jews about the articles of our faith. From their youth they have been so nurtured with venom and rancor against our Lord that there is no hope until they reach the point where their misery finally makes them pliable and they are forced to confess that the Messiah has come and that he is our Jesus. Until such a time it is much too early, yes, it is useless, to argue with them about how God is triune, how he became man, and how Mary is the mother of God. No human reason nor any human heart will ever grant these things, much less the embittered, venomous, blind heart of the Jews. As has already been said, what God cannot reform with such cruel blows, we will be unable to change with words and works. Moses was unable to reform the Pharaoh by means of plagues, miracles, pleas, or threats. He had to let him drown in the sea. Now, in order to strengthen our faith, we want to deal with a few crass follies of the Jews in their belief and their exegesis of the scriptures, since they so maliciously revile our faith. If this should move any Jew to reform and repent, so much the better. We are now not talking with the Jews, but about the Jews and their dealings, so that our Germans, too, might be informed. There is one thing about which they boast and pride themselves beyond measure, and that is their descent from the foremost people on earth, from Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, and from the twelve patriarchs, and thus from the holy people of Israel. St. Paul himself admits this when he says in Romans 9, Quorum patres, that is, to them belong the patriarchs, and of their race is the Christ, etc., and Christ himself declares in John 4, Salvation is from the Jews. Therefore they boast of being the noblest, yes, the only noble people on earth. In comparison with them, and in their eyes, we Gentiles, Goyim, are not humans. In fact, we hardly deserve to be considered poor worms by them. For we are not of that high and noble blood, lineage, birth, and descent. This is their argument, and indeed I think it is the greatest and strongest reason for their pride and boasting. Therefore God has to endure that in their synagogues, their prayers, songs, doctrines, and their whole life, they come and stand before him and plague him grievously, if I may speak of God in such a human fashion. Thus he must listen to their boasts and their praises to him for setting them apart from the Gentiles, for letting them be descended from the holy patriarchs, and for selecting them to be his holy and peculiar people, etc. And there is no limit and no end to this boasting about their descent and their physical birth from their physical fathers. And to fill the measure of their raving, mad, and stupid folly, they boast and they thank God, in the first place, because they were created as human beings and not as animals. In the second place, because they are Israelites and not Goyim, or Gentiles. In the third place, because they were created as males and not as females. They did not learn such tomfoolery from Israel, but from the Goyim. For history records that the Greek Plato did daily accord God such praise and thanksgiving, if such arrogance and blasphemy may be termed praise of God. This man, too, praised his gods for these three items. Number one, that he was a human being and not an animal. Number two, a male and not a female. Number three, a Greek and not a non-Greek or barbarian. This is a fool's boast, the gratitude of a barbarian who blasphemes God. Similarly, the Italians fancy themselves the only human beings. They imagine that all other people in the world are non-humans, mere ducks or mice by comparison. No one can take away from them their pride concerning their blood and their descent from Israel. In the Old Testament, they lost many a battle in wars over this matter, though no Jew understands this. All the prophets censured them for it, for it betrays an arrogant, carnal presumption devoid of spirit and of faith. They were also slain and persecuted for this reason. St. John the Baptist took them to task severely because of it, saying, Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham.
Matthew 3, 9. He did not call them Abraham's children, but a brood of vipers, Matthew 3, 7. Oh, that was too insulting for the noble blood and race of Israel, and they declared, He has a demon, Matthew eleven eighteen. Our Lord also calls them a brood of vipers. Furthermore, in John 8, he states, If you were Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham did. You are of your father, the devil. It was intolerable to them to hear that they were not Abraham's, but the devil's children, nor can they bear to hear this today. If they should surrender this boast and argument, their whole system, which is built on it, would topple and change. I hold that if their Messiah, for whom they hope, should come and do away with their boast and its basis, they would crucify and blaspheme him seven times worse than they did our Messiah. And they would also say that he was not the true Messiah, but a deceiving devil. For they have portrayed their Messiah to themselves as one who would strengthen and increase such carnal and arrogant error regarding nobility of blood and lineage. That is the same as saying that he should assist them in blaspheming God and in viewing his creatures with disdain, including the women, who are also human beings, and the image of God as well as we. Moreover, they are our own flesh and blood, such as mother, sister, daughter, housewives, etc. For in accordance with the aforementioned threefold song of praise, they do not hold Sarah, as a woman, to be as noble as Abraham, as a man. Perhaps they wish to honor themselves for being born half noble of a noble father, and half ignoble of an ignoble mother. But enough of this tomfoolery and trickery. We propose to discuss their argument, and boast, and prove convincingly before God and the world, not before the Jews, for, as already said, they would accept this neither from Moses nor from their Messiah himself, that their argument is quite empty and stands condemned. To this end we quote Moses in Genesis 17, whom they surely ought to believe if they are true Israelites. When God instituted circumcision, he said, among other things, any uncircumcised male shall be cut off from his people. Genesis 17. With these words, God consigns to condemnation all who are born of flesh, no matter how noble, high, or how low their birth may have been. He does not even exempt from this judgment the seed of Abraham, although Abraham was not merely of high and noble birth from Noah, but was also adjudged holy, Genesis 15, and became Abraham instead of Abram, Genesis 17. Yet none of his children shall be numbered among God's people, but rather shall be rooted out, and God will not be his God unless he, over and above his birth, is also circumcised and accepted into the covenant of God. To be sure, before the world one person is properly accounted nobler than another by reason of his birth, or smarter than another because of his intelligence, or stronger and more handsome than another because of his body, or richer and mightier than another in view of his possessions, or better than another on account of his special virtues. For this miserable, sinful, and mortal life must be marked by such differentiation and inequality. The requirements of daily life and the preservation of government make it indispensable. But to strut before God and boast about being so noble, so exalted, and so rich compared to other people, that is devilish arrogance, since every birth according to the flesh is condemned before him without exception in the aforementioned verse, if his covenant and word do not come to the rescue once again and create a new and different birth, quite different from the old first birth. So if the Jews boast in their prayer before God and glory in the fact that they are the patriarch's noble blood, lineage, and children, and that he should regard them and be gracious to them in view of this, while they condemn the Gentiles as ignoble and not of their blood, my dear man, what do you suppose such a prayer will achieve? This is what it will achieve. Even if the Jews were as holy as their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob themselves, yes, even if they were angels in heaven, on account of such a prayer, they would have to be hurled into the abyss of hell. How much less will such prayers deliver them from their exile and return them to Jerusalem? For what does such devilish, arrogant prayer do other than to give God's word the lie? For God declares, Whoever is born and not circumcised shall not only be ignoble and worthless, but shall also be damned 
and shall not be part of my people, and I will not be his God. The Jews rage against this with their blasphemous prayer, as if to say, No, no, Lord God, this is not true. You must hear us, because we are of noble lineage of the Holy Fathers. By reason of such noble birth, you must establish us as lords over all the earth, and in heaven too. If you fail to do this, you break your word and do us an injustice, since you have sworn to our fathers that you will accept their seed as your people forever. This is just as though a king, a prince, or a lord, or a rich, handsome, smart, pious, virtuous person among us Christians were to pray thus to God. O oh Lord God, see what a great king and lord I am. See how rich and smart and pious I am. See what a handsome lad or lass I am in comparison to others. Be gracious, and help me in view of all this, and save me. The other people are not as deserving, because they are not so handsome, rich, smart, pious, noble, and high-born as I am. What do you suppose? Sh should such a prayer merit? It would merit that thunder and lightning strike down from heaven, and that sulfur and hellfire strike from below. That would be just punishment, for flesh and blood must not boast before God. For as Moses says, whoever is born even from holy patriarchs and from Abraham himself stands condemned before God and must not boast before him. St. Paul says the same thing in Romans 3, as does John in John chapter 3. Such a prayer was also spoken by the Pharisee in the gospel as he boasted about all his blessings, saying, I am not like other men. Moreover, his prayer was beautifully adorned, since he said it with thanksgiving, and fancy that he was sitting on God's lap as his pet child. But thunder and lightning from heaven cast him down to hell's abyss, as Christ himself declared, saying that the publican was justified, but the Pharisee condemned. Oh, what do we poor muckworms, maggots, stench, and filth, presume to boast of before him, who is the God and creator of heaven and earth, who made us out of dirt and out of nothing. And as far as our nature, birth, and essence are concerned, we are but dirt and nothing in his eyes. All that we are and have comes from his grace and his rich mercy. Abraham was no doubt even nobler than the Jews, since, as we pointed out above, he was descended from the noblest patriarch, Noah, who in his day was the greatest and oldest lord, priest, and father of the entire world, and from the other nine succeeding patriarchs. Abraham saw, heard, and lived with all of them, and some of them, as for instance Shem, uh, Shelah, Heber, outlived him by many years. So Abraham obviously was not lacking in nobility of blood and birth, yet this did not in the least aid him in being numbered among God's people. No, he was idolatrous, and he would have remained under condemnation if God's word had not called him, as Joshua in chapter 24 informs us out of God's own mouth. Your fathers lived of old beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him, etc. Even later, after he had been called and sanctified through God's word and through faith, according to Genesis 15, Abraham did not boast of his birth or of his virtues. When he spoke with God, Genesis 18, he did not say, Look, how noble I am, born from Noah and the holy patriarchs, and descended from your holy nation. Nor did he say, How pious and holy I am in comparison with other people. No, he said, Behold, I have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord, I, who am but dust and ashes. Genesis 18.27 This is indeed how a creature must speak to its Creator not forgetting what it is before him and how it is regarded by him. For that is what God said of Adam and of all his children. Genesis 3. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. As death itself persuades us visibly and experientially to counteract 
if need be, any such foolish, vain, and vexatious presumption. Now you can see that what fine children of Abraham the Jews really are, how well they take after their father, yes, what a fine people of God they are. They boast before God of their physical birth and of the noble blood inherited from their fathers, despising all other people, although God regards them in all these respects as dust and ashes and damned by birth, the same as all other heathen. And yet they give God the lie, they insist on being in the right, and with such blasphemies and damnable prayer, they purpose to wrest God's grace from him and to regain Jerusalem. Furthermore, even if the Jews were seven times blinder than they are, if that were possible, they would s still have to see that Esau, or Edom, as far as physical birth is concerned, was as noble as Jacob since he was not only the son of the same father, Isaac, and of the same mother, Rebekah, but he was also the firstborn, and primogeniture of that time conferred the highest nobility over against the other children. But what did his equal birth, or even his primogeniture, by virtue of which he was far nobler than Jacob, benefit him? He was still not numbered among God's people, although he called Abraham his grandfather, and Sarah his grandmother, just as Jacob did. Indeed, as has already been said, even more validly than did Jacob. Conversely, Abraham himself, as well as Sarah, had to regard him as their grandson, the son of Isaac and Rebekah. They even had to regard him as the firstborn and the nobler, and Jacob as the lesser. But tell me, what good did his physical birth and his noble blood inherited from Abraham do for him? Someone may interpose that Esau forfeited his honor because he became evil, etc. We must rejoin, first of all, that the question at issue is whether nobility of blood in itself is so valid before God that one could thereby be or become God's people. If it is not, why then do the Jews exalt this birth so highly before other children of men? But if it is valid, why then does God not guard it from falling? For if God regards physical birth as adequate for making the descendants of the holy patriarchs his people, he dare not let them become evil, thereby losing his people and becoming a non-God. If he does, however, let them become evil, it is certain that he does not regard birth as a means of yielding or producing a people for him. In the second place, Esau was not ejected from the people of God because he became evil later on, nor was Jacob counted among the people of God in view of his subsequent good life. No, while they were both still in their mother's womb, the word of God distinguished between the two. Jacob was called, Esau was not. In accordance with the word, the elder shall serve the younger. Genesis 25. This was not at all affected by the fact that they were both carried under the same mother's heart, that they were both nourished with the same milk and blood of one and the same mother, Rebekah, that they were both born of her at the same time. So one must say that no matter how identical flesh, blood, milk, body, and mother were in this instance, they could not help Esau, nor could they hinder Jacob from acquiring the grace by which people become God's children or his people? Decisive here are the word and calling which ignore the birth. Ishmael, too, can say that he is equally a true and natural son of Abraham. But what does his physical birth avail him? Despite this, he has to yield up the home and heritage of Abraham and leave it to his brother Isaac. You may say that Ishmael was born of Hagar, while Isaac was born of Sarai. If anything, this strengthens our argument, for Isaac's birth from Sarai was affected by the word of God and not by flesh and blood, since Sarah was past the natural age for bearing children. To discuss the question of birth a bit further, although Ishmael is Abraham's flesh and blood and his natural son, still the flesh and blood of such a holy father does not help him. It rather harms him because he has no more than flesh and blood from Abraham and does not also have God's word in his favor. The fact that Isaac is descended from the blood of Abraham does not handicap him, even though it was useless to Ishmael, because he has the word of God, which distinguishes him from his brother Ishmael, who is of the flesh and blood of the same Abraham. 
Why should so much ado be made of this? After all, if birth counts before God, I can claim to be just as noble as any Jew. Yes, just as noble as Abraham himself, as David, as all the holy prophets and apostles. Nor will I owe them any thanks if they consider me just as noble as themselves before God by reason of my birth. And if God refuses to acknowledge my nobility and birth as the equal to that of Ab Isaac, Abraham, David, and all the saints, I maintain that he is doing me an injustice, that he is not a fair judge. For I will not give it up, and neither Abraham, David, prophets, apostles, nor even an angel in heaven shall deny me the right to boast that Noah, so far as physical birth or flesh and blood is concerned, is my true natural ancestor, and that his wife, whoever she may have been, is my true natural ancestress. For we are all descended since the deluge from that one Noah. We did not descend from Cain, for his family perished forever in the flood, together with many of the cousins, brothers-in-law, and friends of Noah. I also boast that Japheth, Noah's firstborn son, is my true natural ancestor, and his wife, whomever she may have been, is my true natural ancestress. For as Moses informs us in Genesis 10, he is the progenitor of all us Gentiles. Thus Shem, the second son of Noah, and all his descendants have no grounds to boast over against his older brother Japheth because of their birth. Indeed, if birth is to play a role, then Japheth, as the oldest and the true heir, has reason for boasting over against Shem, his younger brother, and Shem's descendants, whether these be called Jews, or Ishmaelites, or Edomites. But what does physical primogeniture help? the good Japheth, our ancestor, nothing at all. Shem enjoys precedence, not by reason of birth, which would accord precedence to Japheth, but because God's word and calling are the arbiter here. I could go back to the beginning of the world and trace our common ancestry from Adam and Eve, later from Shem, Enoch, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, for all of these are our ancestors just as well as the Jews, and we share equally in the honor, nobility, and fame of descent from them as do the Jews. We are their flesh and blood, just the same as Abraham and all his seed are, for we were in the loins of the same holy fathers in the same measure as they were, and there is no difference whatsoever with regard to birth or flesh and blood, as reason must tell us. Therefore the blind Jews are truly stupid fools, much more absurd than the Gentiles, to boast so before God of their physical birth, though they are by reason of it no better than the Gentiles, since we both partake of one birth, one flesh and blood, from the very first, best, and holiest ancestors. Neither one can reproach or upbraid the other about some peculiarity, without implicating himself at the same time. But let us move on. David lumps all together nicely and convincingly when he declares in Psalm 51, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now go, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, born of Adam or Abraham, of Enoch or David, and boast before God of your fine nobility, of your exalted lineage, your ancient ancestry. Here you learn that we all are conceived and born in sin, by father and mother, and no human being is excluded. But what does it mean to be born in sin other than to be born under God's wrath and condemnation, so that by nature or birth we are unable to be God's people or children, and our birth, glory, and nobility, our honor and praise, denote nothing more and can denote nothing else than that, in default of anything to our credit, other than our physical birth, we are condemned sinners, enemies of God, and in his disfavor. There, Jew, you have your boast, and we Gentiles have ours together with you, as well as you with us. Now go ahead and pray that God might respect your nobility, your race, your flesh, and blood. This, 
I wanted to say for the strengthening of our faith. For the Jews will not give up their pride in boasting about their nobility and lineage. As was said above, their hearts are hardened. Our people, however, must be on their guard against them, lest they be misled by this impenitent, accursed people who give God the lie and haughtily despise all the world. For the Jews would like to entice us Christians to their faith, and they do this wherever they can. If God is to become gracious also to them, the Jews, they must first of all banish such such blasphemous prayers and songs that boast so arrogantly about their lineage from their synagogues, from their hearts, and from their lips. For such prayers ever increase and sharpen God's wrath toward them. However, they will not do this, nor will they humble themselves abjectly, except for a few individuals whom God draws unto himself particularly and delivers from their terrible ruin. The other boast and nobility over which the Jews gloat and because of which they haughtily and vainly despise all mankind is their circumcision, which they received from Abraham. My God, what we Gentiles have to put up with in their synagogues, prayers, songs, and doctrines. What a stench we poor people are in their nostrils, because we are not circumcised. Indeed, God himself must again submit to miserable torment, if I may put it thus, as they confront him with inexpressible presumption and boast, Praised be thou, King of the world, who singled us out from all the nations and sanctified us by the covenant of circumcision. And similarly, with many other words, the tenor of all of which is that God should esteem them above all the rest of the world, because they, in compliance with his decree, are circumcised, and that he should condemn all other people, just as they do and wish to do. In this boast of nobility, they glory as they do in their physical birth. Consequently, I believe that if Moses himself would appear together with Elijah and their Messiah and would try to deprive them of this boast or forbid such prayers and doctrine, they would probably consider all three of them to be the three worst devils in hell, and they would be at a loss to know how to curse and damn them adequately, to say nothing of believing them. For they have decided amongst themselves that Moses, together with Elijah and the Messiah, should endorse circumcision. Yes, rather, that they should help to strengthen and praise such arrogance and pride in circumcision, than that these should, like themselves, look upon all Gentiles as awful filth and stench, because they are not circumcised. Moses, Elijah, and the Messiah must do all they prescribe, think, and which. They insist that they are right, and if God himself were to do other than what they think, he would be in the wrong. Now, just behold these miserable, blind, and senseless people. In the first place, as I said previously in regard to physical birth, if I were to concede that circumcision is sufficient to make them a people of God, or to sanctify and set them apart before God from all other nations, then the conclusion would have to be this. Whoever was circumcised could not be evil, nor could he be damned. Nor would God permit this to happen if he regarded circumcision as imbued with such holiness and power. Just as we Christians say, whoever has faith cannot be evil and cannot be damned so long as faith endures. For God regards faith as so precious, valuable, and powerful that it will surely sanctify and prevent him who has faith and retains his faith from being lost or becoming evil. But I shall let this go for now. In the second place, we note here again how the Jews provoke God's anger more and more with such prayer. For there they stand and defame God with a blasphemous, shameful, and impudent lie. They are so blind and stupid that they see neither the words found in Genesis 17, nor the whole of Scripture, which mightily and explicitly condemns this lie. For in Genesis 17, Moses states that Abraham was ordered to circumcise not only his son Isaac, who at the time was not yet born, but all the males born in his house, whether sons or servants, including the slaves. All of these were circumcised on one day together with Abraham, Ishmael too, who at the time was thirteen years of age, as the text informs us. Thus the covenant or decree of circumcision encompasses the entire seed of all the descendants of Abraham, particularly Ishmael, who was the first seed of Abraham to be circumcised. Accordingly, 
Ishmael is not only the equal of his brother Isaac, but he might even, if this were to be esteemed before God, be entitled to boast of his circumcision more than Isaac, since he was circumcised one year sooner. In view of this, the Ishmaelites might well enjoy a higher repute than the Israelites, for their forefather Ishmael was circumcised before Isaac, the progenitor of the Isra Israelites, was born. Why then do the Jews lie so shamefully before God in their prayers and preaching, as though circumcision were theirs alone, through which they were set apart from all other nations, and thus they alone are God's holy people? They should really, if they were capable of it, be a bit ashamed before the Ishmaelites, the Edomites, and other nations, when they considered that they were at all times a small nation, scarcely a handful of people in comparison with others, who were also Abraham's seed, and were also circumcised, and who indubitably transmitted such a command of their father Abraham to their descendants, and that the circumcision transmitted to the one son Isaac is rather insignificant when compared with the circumcision transmitted to Abraham's other sons. For Scripture records that Ishmael, Abraham's son, became a great nation, that he begat twelve princes, also that the six sons of Keturah, Genesis 25, possessed much greater areas of land than Israel, and undoubtedly these observed the rite of circumcision handed down to them by their fathers. Now, since circumcision, as decreed by God in Genesis 17, is practiced by so many nations, beginning with Abraham, whose seed they all are the same as Isaac and Jacob, and since there is no difference in this regard between them and the children of Israel, what are the Jews really doing when they praise and thank God in their prayers for singling them out by circumcision from all other nations, for sanctifying them, and for making them his own people? This is what they are doing. They are blaspheming God and giving him the lie concerning his commandment and his words, where he says in Genesis 17 that circumcision shall not be prescribed for Isaac and his descendants alone, but for all the seed of Abraham. The Jews have no favored position exalting them above Ishmael by reason of circumcision, or above Edom, Midian, Ephah, Ephah, etc., all of whom are reckoned in Genesis as Abraham's seed, for they were all circumcised and made heirs of circumcision, the same as Israel. Now, what does it benefit Ishmael that he is circumcised? What does it benefit Edom that he is circumcised? Edom, who, moreover, is descended from Isaac, who was set apart and not from Ishmael. What does it benefit Midian and his brothers, born of Keturah, that they are circumcised? They are, for all of that, not God's people. Neither their descent from Abraham nor their circumcision, commanded by God, helps them. If circumcision does not help them in becoming God's people, how can it help the Jews? For it is one and the same circumcision, decreed by one and the same God. And there is one and the same Father, flesh and blood, or descent, that is common to all. There is absolute equality. There is no difference, no distinction among them all, so far as circumcision and birth are concerned. Therefore, it is not a clever and ingenious, but a clumsy, foolish, and stupid lie when the Jews boast of their circumcision before God, presuming that God should regard them graciously for that reason, though they should certainly know from Scripture that they are not the only race circumcised in compliance with God's decree, and that they cannot on that account be God's special people. Something more different and greater is necessary for that, since the Ishmaelites, the Edomites, the Midianites, and other descendants of Abraham may equally comfort themselves with this glory, even before God himself. For with regard to birth and circumcision, these are, as already said, their equals. Perhaps the Jews will declare that the Ishmaelites and Edomites, etc., do not observe the rite of circumcision as strictly as they do. In addition to cutting off the foreskin of a male child, the Jews force the skin back on the little penis and tear it open with sharp fingernails, as one reads in their books. Thus they cause extraordinary pain to the child, without and against the command of God, so that the father, who should really be happy over the circumcision, stands there and weeps as his child's cries pierce his heart. We answer roundly 
But such an addendum is their own invention. Yes, it was inspired by the accursed devil and is in contradiction to God's command. Since Moses says in Deuteronomy 4 and 12, you should not add to the word which I command you nor take away from it. With such a devilish supplement, they ruin their circumcision so that in the sight of God, no other nation practices circumcision less than they. Since with such wanton disobedience, they append and practice this damnable supplement. Now, let's see what Moses himself says about circumcision. In Deuteronomy 10, he says, Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no longer stubborn, etc. Dear Moses, what do you mean? Does it not suffice that they are circumcised physically? They are set apart from all other nations by this holy circumcision and made a holy people of God. And you rebuke them for stubbornness against God. You belittle their holy circumcision. You revile the holy circumcised people of God. You should venture to talk like that today in their synagogues. If there were not stones conveniently near, they would resort to mud and dirt to drive you from their sight, even if you were worth ten Moseses. Moses also chides them in Leviticus 26, saying, If then their uncircumcised heart is humbled, etc. Be careful, Moses. Do you know whom you are speaking to? You are talking to a noble, chosen, holy, circumcised people of God. And you dare say to them that they have uncircumcised hearts? That is much worse than having a seven times uncircumcised flesh, for an uncircumcised heart can have no God. And to such the circumcision of the flesh is of no avail. Only a circumcised heart can produce a people of God, and it can do this even when physical circumcision is absent or is impossible, as it was for the children of Israel during their forty years in the wilderness. Thus, Jeremiah also takes them to task, saying in chapter 4, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it. Jeremiah, you wretched heretic, you seducer and false prophet, how dare you tell that holy, circumcised people of God to circumcise themselves to the Lord? Do you mean to imply that they were hitherto circumcised physically to the devil, as if God did not esteem their holy physical circumcision? And are you furthermore threatening them with God's wrath, as an eternal fire, if they do not circumcise their hearts? But they do not mention such circumcision of the heart in their prayer, nor do they praise or thank God for it with a much as much as a single letter. And you dare to invalidate their holy circumcision of the flesh, making it liable to God's wrath and the eternal fire? I advise you, Jeremiah, not to enter their synagogue. All devils might dismember and devour you there. In Jeremiah 6, we read further. Their ears are uncircumcised. They cannot listen. Well, well, my dear Jeremiah, you are surely dealing roughly and inconsiderately with the noble, chosen, holy, circumcised people of God. Do you mean to say that such a holy nation has uncircumcised ears? And what is far worse, that they are unable to hear? Is that not tantamount to saying that they are not God's people? For he who cannot hear or bear to hear God's word is not of God's people. And if they are not God's people, then they are the devil's people. And then neither circumcising nor skinning nor scraping will avail. For God's sake, Jeremiah, stop talking like that. How can you despise and condemn holy circumcision so horribly when you separate the chosen, circumcised, holy people from God and consign them to the devil as banished and damned? Do they not praise God for having set them apart through circumcision, both from the devil and from all the other nations, and for making them a holy and peculiar people? Yea, he has spoken blasphemy. Crucify him. Crucify him. In chapter 9, Jeremiah says further, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will punish all those who are circumcised but yet uncircumcised, Egypt, Judah, Edom, the sons of Ammon, Moab, 
and all who dwell in the desert. For all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. In the face of this, what becomes of the arrogant boast of circumcision, by reason of which the Jews claim to be a holy nation set apart from other peoples? Here God's word lumps them together with the heathen and uncircumcised, and threatens the same visitation for both. Moreover, the best part of Israel, the noble royal tribe of Judah, is mentioned here, and after that the entire house of Israel. Worst of all, he declares that the heathen are, to be sure, uncircumcised according to the flesh, but that Judah, Edom, and Israel, who are circumcised according to the flesh, are much viler than the heathen, since they have an uncircumcised heart, and this, as said before, is far worse than uncircumcised flesh. These and similar passages prove irrefutably that the Jews' arrogance and boast of circumcision over against the uncircumcised Gentiles are null and void, and unless accompanied by something else, deserves nothing but God's wrath. God says that they have an uncircumcised heart, but the Jews do not pay attention to such a foreskin of the heart. Rather, they think that God should behold their proud circumcision of the flesh and hear their arrogant boasts over against all Gentiles, who are unable to boast of such circ circumcision. These blind, miserable people do not see that God condemns their uncircumcised hearts so clearly and explicitly in these verses, and thereby condemns their physical circumcisions together with their boasting and their prayers. They go their way like fools, making the foreskins of their hearts steadily thicker with such haughty boasts before God and their contempt for all other people. By virtue of such futile, arrogant circumcision in the flesh, they presume to be God's holy, only people, until the foreskin of their heart has become thicker than an iron mountain, and they can no longer hear, see, or feel their own clear scripture, which they read daily with blind eyes, overgrown with a pelt thicker than the bark of an oak tree. If God is to give ear to their prayers and praises and accept them, they must surely first purge their synagogues, mouths, and hearts of such blasphemous, shameful, false, and deceitful boasting and arrogance. Otherwise, they will only go from bad to worse and arouse God's anger ever more against themselves. For he who would pray before God dare not confront him with haughtiness and lying. He dare not only praise himself, condemn all others, claim to be God's only people, and execrate all the others as they do. As David says in Psalm 5, For thou art not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not sojourn with thee. The boastful may not stand before thy eyes. Thou hatest all evildoers. Thou destroyest those who speak lies. The Lord abhors bloodthirsty and deceitful men. But rather, as verse 7 tells us, I, through the abundance of thy steadfast love, will enter thy house. I will worship toward thy holy temple in the fear of thee. This psalm applies to all men, whether circumcised or not, but particularly and especially to the Jews, for whom it was especially given and composed, as was all the rest of Scripture also. And they are more masterfully portrayed in it than all other heathen. For they are the ones who constantly have pursued godless ways, idolatry, false doctrine, and who have had uncircumcised hearts, as Moses himself and all the prophets cry out and lament. But in all this they always claimed to be pleasing to God, and they slew all the prophets on this account. They are the malicious, stiff-necked people that would not be converted from evil to good works by the preaching, reproof, and teaching of the prophets. The scriptures bear witness to this everywhere, and still they claim to be God's servants and to stand before him. They are the boastful, arrogant rascals who to the present day can do no more than boast of their race and lineage, praise only themselves, and disdain and curse all the world in their synagogues, prayers, and doctrines. Despite this, they imagine that in God's eyes they rank as his dearest children. They are real liars and bloodhounds who have only continually perverted and falsified all of Scripture, 
with their mendacious glosses from the beginning until the present day. Their heart's most ardent sighing and yearning and hoping is set on the day on which they can deal with the Gentiles, as they did with the Gentiles in Persia at the time of Esther. Oh, how fond they are of the book of Esther, which is so beautifully attuned to their bloodthirsty, vengeful, murderous yearning and hope. The sun has never shone on a more bloodthirsty and vengeful people than they are who imagine that they are God's people, who have been commissioned and commanded to murder and to slay the Gentiles. In fact, the most important thing that they expect of their Messiah is that he will murder and kill the entire world with their sword. They treated us Christians in this like manner at the very beginning throughout all the world. They would still like to do this if they had the power, and often enough have made the attempt for which they have got their snouts boxed lustily. We can perhaps enlarge on this subject later, but let us now return to their false, lying boast regarding circumcision. These shameful liars are well aware that they are not the exclusive people of God, even if they did possess circumcision to the exclusion of all other nations. They also know that the foreskin is no obstacle to being a people of God, and still they brazenly strut before God, lie and boast about being God's only people by reason of their physical circumcision, unmindful of the circumcision of the heart. Against this, there are weighty scriptural examples. In the first place, we adduce Job, who, as they say, descended from Nahor. God did not impose circumcision on him and his heirs, and yet his book shows clearly that there were very few great saints in Israel who were the equal of him and of his people, nor did the prophet Elisha oblige Naaman of Syria to become circumcised, and yet he was sanctified and became a child of God, and undoubtedly many others with him. Furthermore, there stands the whole of the prophet Jonah, who converted Nineveh to God and preserved it together with kings, princes, lords, land, and people, yet did not circumcise these people. Similarly, Daniel converted the great kings and peoples of Babylon and Persia, such as Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus, Darius, etc., and yet they remained Gentiles, uncircumcised, and did not become Jews. Earlier, Joseph instructed Pharaoh the king, his princes, and his people, as Psalm 105 informs us, yet he left them uncircumcised. This, I say, these hardened and inveterate liars know, yet they stress circumcision so greatly, as though no uncircumcised person could be a child of God. And whenever they seduce a Christian, they try to alarm him so that he will be circumcised. Subsequently, they approach God and exult in their prayer, that they have brought us to the people of God through circumcision, as though this were a precious deed. They disdain, despise, and curse the foreskin on us as an ugly abomination which prevents us from becoming God's people, while their circumcision, they claim, affects all. What is God to do with such prayer and praise which they bring forth together with their coarse, blasphemous lying, contrary to all scripture, as already stated? He will indeed hear them and bring them back to their country. I mean that if they were dwelling in heaven, such boasts, prayers, praise, and lies about circumcision alone would hurl them instantly into the abyss of hell. I have already written about this against the Sabbatarians. Therefore, dear Christian, be on your guard against such damnable people whom God has permitted to sink into such profound abominations and lies, for all they do and say must be sheer lying, blasphemy, and malice, however fine it may look. But, you may ask, of what use then is circumcision, or why did God command it so strictly? We answer, let the Jews fret about that. What does that matter to us Gentiles? It was not imposed on us, as you have heard, nor do we stand in need of it. But we can be God's people without it, just as the people in Nineveh, in Babylon, in Persia, and in Egypt were. And no one can prove that God ever commanded a prophet or a Jew to circumcise the Gentiles. Therefore they should not harass us with their lies and idolatry. If they claim to be so smart and wise as to instruct and circumcise us Gentiles, let them first tell us what purpose circumcision serves, and why God commanded it so strictly. This they owe us, 
but they will not do it until they return to their home in Jerusalem again. That is to say, when the devil ascends into heaven. For when they assert that God enjoins circumcision for the purpose of sanctifying them, saving them, making them God's people, they are lying atrociously, as you have heard. For Moses and all the prophets testify that circumcision did not help even those for whom it was commanded, since they were of uncircumcised hearts. How then should it help us for whom it was not commanded? But to speak for us Christians, we know very well why it was given or what purpose it served. However, no Jew knows this, and even when we tell him, it is just like addressing a stump or a stone. They will not desist from their boasting and their pride, that is, from their lies. They insist that they are in the right. God must be the liar, and he must be in error. Therefore let them go their way and lie, as their fathers have done from the beginning. But St. Paul teaches us, in Romans 3, that when circumcision is performed, as a kind of work, it cannot make holy or save, nor was it meant to do so. Nor does it damn the uncircumcised Gentiles, as the Jews mendaciously and blasphemously say. Rather, he says, circumcision is of great value in this way, that they were entrusted with the word of God. Romans chapter 3. That is the point. There it is said. There it is found. Circumcision was given and instituted to enfold and to preserve God's word and his promise. This means that circumcision should not be useful or sufficient as a work in itself, but those who possess circumcision should be bound by the sign, covenant, or sacrament to obey and to believe God in his words and to transmit all this to their descendants. But where such a final cause or reason for circumcision no longer obtained, circumcision as a mere work no longer was to enjoy validity or value, all the more so if the Jews should patch or attach another final cause or explanation to it. This is also borne out by the words in Genesis 17, I will be your God, and in token of this you shall bear my sign upon your flesh. This expresses the same thought found in St. Paul's statement, that circumcision was given so that one should hear or obey God's word. For when God's word is no longer heard or kept, then he is surely no longer our God, since we in this life must comprehend and have God solely through his word. This wretched life cannot bear and endure him in his brilliant majesty, as he says in Exodus 36, Man shall not see me and live. There are innumerable examples throughout all scripture which show what cause or purpose the Jews assigned to circumcision. For as often as God wanted to speak with them through the prophets, whether about the Ten Commandments, in which he reproved them, or about the promise of future help, they were always obdurate, or as the quoted verses from Moses and Jeremiah testify, they were of uncircumcised heart and ears. They always claimed to do the right and proper thing, while the prophets, that is, God himself, whose word they preached, always did the wrong and evil thing. Therefore the Jews slew them all, and they have never yet allowed any to die unpersecuted and uncondemned, with the exception of a few at the time of David, Hezekiah, and Josiah. The entire course of the history of Israel and Judah is pervaded by blasphemy of God's word, by persecution, by derision, and by murder of the prophets. Judging them by history, these people must be called wanton murderers of the prophets and enemies of God's word. Whoever reads the Bible cannot draw any other conclusion. As we said, God did not institute circumcision, nor did he accept the Jews as his people, in order that they might persecute, mock, and murder his word and his prophets, and thereby render a service to justice and to God. Rather, as Moses says in the words dealing with circumcision in Genesis 17, this was done in order that they might hear God and his word, that is, that they might let him be their God. Apart from this, circumcision in itself would not help them, since it would then no longer be God's circumcision, for it would be without God, contending against his word. It would have become merely a human work, for he had bound himself, or his word, to circumcision. Where these two part company, circumcision remains a hollow husk or empty shell, devoid of nut or kernel. The following is an analogous situation for us Christians. 
God gave us baptism, the sacrament of his body and blood, and the keys for the ultimate purpose or final cause that we should hear his word in them and exercise our faith therein. That is, he intends to be our God through them, and through them we are to be his people. However, what did we do? We proceeded to separate the word and faith from the sacrament, that is, from God and his ultimate purpose, and converted it into a mere opus legis, a work of the law, or as the papists call it, an opus operetum, merely a human work, which the priests offered to God and the laity performed as a work of obedience as often as they received it. What is left of the sacrament? Only the empty husk, the mere ceremony, opus vanum, divested of everything divine. Yet it is a hideous abomination in which we perverted God's truth into lies and worshipped the veritable calf of Aaron. Therefore God also delivered us into all sorts of terrible blindness and innumerable false doctrines. And furthermore, he permitted Muhammad and the Pope together with all devils to come upon us. The people of Israel fared similarly. They always divorced circumcision as an opus operatum, their own work from the word of God, and persecuted all the prophets through whom God wished to speak with them, according to the terms on which circumcision was instituted. Yet despite this, they constantly and proudly boasted of being God's people by virtue of their circumcision. Thus they are in conflict with God. God wants them to hear him and to observe circumcision properly and fully, but they refuse and insist that God respect their work of circumcision, that is, half of circumcision, indeed the husk, of circumcision. God, in turn, refuses to do this, and so they move farther and farther apart, and it is impossible to reunite or reconcile them. Now, who wishes to accuse God of an injustice? Tell me, anyone who is reasonable, whether it is fitting that God regard the works of those who refuse to hear his word, or if he should consider them to be his people when they do not want to regard him as their God. With all justice and good reason, God may say, as the psalm declares, Psalm 81, Israel would have none of me, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. And in Deuteronomy 32, Moses states, They have stirred me to jealousy with that which is no God, so I will stir them to jealousy with those who are no people. Similarly, among us Christians, the papists can no longer pass for the church, for they will not let God be their God, because they refuse to listen to his word, but rather persecute it most terribly, then come along with their empty husks, chaff, and refuse, as they hold mass and practice their ceremonies. And God is supposed to recognize them and look upon them as his true church, ignoring the fact that they do not acknowledge him as the true God, that is, they do not want him to speak to them through his preachers. His word must be accounted heresy, the devil, and every evil. This he will indeed do, as they surely will experience, far worse than did the Jews. Now we can readily gather from all this that circumcision was very useful and good, as St. Paul declares, not indeed on its own account, but on account of the word of God. For we are convinced, and it is the truth, that the children who were circumcised on the eighth day became children of God, as the word state, I will be their God, Genesis 17, for they received the perfect and full circumcision, the word with the sign, and did not separate the two. God is present, saying to them, I will be their God, and this completed the circumcision in them. Similarly, our children received the complete, true, and full baptism, the word with the sign, and do not separate one from the other. They receive the kernel in the shell. God is present, he baptizes, and speaks with them, and thereby saves them. But now that we have grown old, the Pope comes along, and the devil with him, and teaches us to convert this into an opus legis, or an opus operatum. He severs word and sign from each other, teaching that we are saved by our own contrition, work, and satisfaction. We share this experience related by St. Peter in 2 Peter 2. Quote, The dog turns back to his own vomit, and the sow is washed only to wallow in the mire. Thus our sacrament has become a work, and we eat our vomit again. Likewise, the Jews, as they grew old, 
ruined their good circumcision performed on the eighth day, separated the word from the sign, and made a human or even a swinish work out of it. In this way, they lost God and his word, and now no longer have any understanding of the scriptures.